hello everyone. I would start with uh, some quick uh, housekeeping rules for uh, the webinar before we start. And thank you so much for uh, for joining our first uh, meeting, stakeholder meeting of uh, the new mandate, which was delayed due to due to the coronavirus situation. But we hope that this uh, will work well and. Uh, that we can um, do more meetings uh, of the group this year. Uh, before we start, uh, just some basic rules um, on how you can join the conversations. Of course, we have the agenda with uh, two keynote presentations and uh, five um, panelists that will react on the recommendations presented and uh, the co-chairs of the MEPs Against Cancer group will um, moderate uh, the discussion throughout uh, the two uh, the one and a half hours um, but there will be two discussion windows one about the eu for health program and one about the um, uh, mission of horizon europe where you can also join the discussion so you can either raise your hand and we have our colleague olga who, who will um, also help identify who should speak. Uh, so once you hear your name, we will also um, enable your microphone and you can comment or ask a question. Um, or you can just type in the chat uh, whether you would like to take the, if you would like to take the floor. Um, in case you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can uh, use the chat function uh, and private message Gina ECL who can also help you support. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to Lucas Furlas, the um, co-chair of MEPs Against Cancer Interest Group and um, member of the Cancer Special Committee on Cancer and the EPP Group. So I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, Lucas, you can go ahead. Uh, Lucas, you are you are muted. Um, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? So thank you very much, Anna, for the floor. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm pleased to be invited to this uh, meeting, even though we are meeting virtually there in person. Uh, we are meeting today to discuss pediatric cancer. Gold September is the month that is dedicated to pediatric cancer awareness. Pediatric cancer is the first uh, cause of death by disease in children over one year old in Europe. Inequalities in accessing the best available care and treatment cause important difference in children's survival rates among European countries. Our role is to provide equal access to all children in Europe, to provide funding for research and treatments. No child should strangle us alone, and that is our mission. I am pleased to let you know that after having a discussion uh, two days ago with the commissioner and good friend of mine, Stella Kiragidis, I have been informed that funds for the cancer plan have not been reduced. Uh, in addition, we have made huge steps forward with the establishment of the new Special Committee for Cancer, of which I'm, I am a full member. I can assure you that we will be working closely with our group, MEPs Against Cancer, and I'm sure that you are willing to work closely too. So now, uh, I'm going to hand you over to the first speaker, the expert, Dr. Pamela Kurtz, who is going to talk about the EU health in relation to pediatric cancer. Welcome, doctor, and thank you all for your attention. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas, and thank you very much to the MEPs Against Cancer um, for hosting this event, as you say, in September, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, yes. and in the month of Parliament that has been lit up in gold in honour of the Shine Gold appeal. Um, and I think that is a huge visible recognition of the commitment of the Parliament to childhood cancer. I'm going to try to share my screen. I hope this works. Um, so I hope you can all see my, my slides now. 
Um, what I'd like to walk through over the next 15 minutes is what the EU for Health program can do for paediatric cancer, where we as a community in paediatric oncology can really see the benefit that could be derived out of the EU for Health program. And as Lucas has already alluded to, the facts are there. Childhood cancer is the first cause of death in children from disease over the age of one. And across Europe, 35,000 cases are diagnosed annually. And 6,000 of these young people die every year in Europe still. And of those that survive, over half, 60% of those survivors have life-changing side effects of either their treatment or their disease, which affects how they live their, their adult life. So there's a huge amount of work still to be done to improve the lives of these young people. And it has to be re-emphasized that childhood cancer is not just a mini version of adult cancers. It is a can they are cancers that affect a heterogeneous population. The impact on children is different from the impact on teenagers and, and the young people. And the impact is not only on the patients, but also on their families. And they carry that impact across into survivorship. Each individual cancer, and there are over a hundred different subtypes of childhood cancer, it is not just one entity, and each individual cancer is rare. rare. It falls into the concept of rare diseases, and each individual cancer is even rarer. So each problem that we have to, to, to uh, find a solution for is not just about one cancer, but addressing all these individual cancers and how it impacts on different age groups. And this is defined by the biology of the disease, the clinical presentation, but also importantly, uh, and particularly in the context of the EU for Health, how childhood cancer is treated and the organisational infrastructure for treatment. Well, we have defined four basic unmet needs, and I'm going to go through these in the presentation, but the theme throughout all of them is inequality. There still remains, if you uh, look across the whole of Europe, unacceptable inequalities in outcomes for children with cancer. There is a 20% difference in the survival chances of a child diagnosed in the, towards the East or Southern Europe compared to the North and West. And this is due to unequal access to the best available treatment. And I'll come back to what that means in detail. There is still a lack of therapeutic innovation for children. I've been practicing medicine for over 30 years now. And the drugs, the anti-cancer drugs that we use to treat children today are the same ones as when I graduated. And they were all originally developed for the treatment of adult cancers. And in spite of the massive innovation that's been ongoing in the adult cancer world, the last decade has seen only nine new medicines licensed for children with cancer. And that compares to over 150 in the adult cancer world. And I'd just like to remind you that some of those drugs licensed in the adult cancer world could have been relevant to children had they been investigated. We also need to understand <clears throat> that the early phase clinical trial, that early testing ground for new agents, for new innovation, for many children is their second chance of, of life. Once they have exhausted all uh, current standard cancer treatments, families and children look to hope and going on to an early phase clinical trial is a chance of hope. And there are still only limited availabilities of clinical trials and they are limited to certain centres in certain countries. And so EU for Health, I'll come back to how that could help improve that access. And our half a million paediatric cancer survivors in Europe are underserved. There is a lack of organised surveillance for the long term side effects across Europe. And again, there is inequality. Some countries have got this very well developed and in other countries it is barely embryonic. And throughout all this, we need to remember the vulnerabilities of these families. The parental involvement through every aspect of the disease and healthcare needs to be facilitated and improved. And so these are four major areas that we would like to see the EU for Health focus on. And I'm going to give some very concrete suggestions as to how that could be supported. How do we come to this conclusion? Well, it's because we work in a, a very well-networked community. SIOP Europe um, is an, a society that represents the healthcare professionals in, who look after children and young people with cancer. 
And we work closely with Chartered Cancer International Europe, the parent patient organization, CCI Europe, and PanCare, which is an organization that looks after the care of survivors, both in research and in healthcare. SIOP Europe represents all the clinical trial groups for all the different diseases across Europe, as well as the national societies for pediatric oncology across Europe. And we have representation in all EU member states and total 36 countries across Europe. And together the leaders, the key opinion leaders across Europe come together under the SIOP Europe Clinical Research Council. And we would work closely, as I say, with CCI Europe and PanCare, but also in cooperation with pharmaceutical partners and collaborate on EU projects and platforms. And there's a, a number of logos there to just demonstrate the many projects that have been supported by Europe that have allowed us to identify the challenges and pro, pro, propose solutions for children with cancer. And I'd just like to highlight a couple of programmes that have really developed some of the consensus statements and recommendations that underpin where we feel the EU for Health can help. So going back to uh, the EPAC, the European Partnership Actions Against Cancer, this defined what the essential conditions to deliver optimal services for childhood cancer patients should be. And this was um, followed, uh, associated with the European Guide for National Cancer Control Programs that recognized that nationally there needed to be specialized services to support pediatric cancer patients. So these consensus statements already exist. And then following this, the Joint Action on Comprehensive Cancer Control defined a European guide on quality improvement, which specifically stated that the long-term follow-up for childhood, adolescents and young adult cancers needed to be implemented on, a, implemented on a specific policy. And in terms of innovation, even more recently, the Work Package 9 of the Innovative Partnerships of Actions Against Cancer, IPAC, specifically stated the, the need to address innovative therapies for children with cancer. The Joint Action on Rare Cancer had childhood cancer well within the heart of this, and this has already defined a number of key components to improve the outcomes for children with cancer. Specifically, standard care recommendations for the organisation of radiotherapy services were defined. There was a very important project led by Gilles Vassal, one of our, the previous presidents of SIOP Europe, working in partnership with young SIOP, our young uh, uh, oncologists of the future, to define the issue of how we access essential medicines for childhood cancer. And just to highlight from that project, they defined six, over 60 drugs that are the essential anti-cancer med anti -cancer medicines for childhood cancer. And then a survey across Europe identified that less than half of these drugs were available 90% of the time in all childhood cancer treatment centers. So that means that a substantial number of children were not getting access to the essential medicines needed to treat their treatment at all times. The, the um, Rare Cancer Initiative defined 10 recommendations to address standards of therapy, essential medicines, innovation and survivorship. And the implementation of these recommendations should be within the scope of the EU for Health. They're an important, very well-defined, and very well-researched recommendations to improve the outcomes for childhood cancer. And then finally, it's not just the Commission that has recognised the importance of childhood cancer, but also the Parliament and the Envy Committee in their recent study to strengthen Europe in the fight against cancer, defined a specific chapter on rare cancers and cancers in children. And within the recommendations for childhood cancer, I defined our four recommendations for the scope of the EU for health, the, access, the equal access to um, best possible care for children, therapeutic innovation, the needs for survivors, and the rights of children with cancer and their families throughout their treatment pathway. All this underpins um, the work that has been ongoing over the last decade. And when the consultation exercise went out over the EU Beating Cancer Plan, it was notable the number of responses that came from the paediatric oncology community with over 200 responses to this public consultation. I think we all recognise that, that we've reached a really pivotal moment, that there is a huge realistic potential to make change for these children and young people through 
EU for Health, through the Beating Cancer Plan, and of course the EU mission that we'll hear, hear about later on. So in the next four slides, I want to just summarise what where the paediatric oncology community would like to call on EU for Health to invest to make substantial difference. So the first point is in the inequalities issue. The inequalities, as I've mentioned before, are about access to the best clinical practice from diagnosis through treatment, through access to essential medicines to reduce the differences in survival rates. It cannot be acceptable that a child in any part of Europe does not have the equal chance of survival due to the standards of care, access to standards of care. Linking the current framework across Europe, we have specialist centres for the treatment of childhood cancer, and we have networks that deliver clinical trial research, which underpin all the improvements that have happened over the last decades in childhood cancer. And the linkage of these groups was culminated in the European Reference Network for Paediatric Cancer, the ERN PEDCAM. And this was, I think, a pivotal moment in how we could address inequalities across Europe. Having established this network, bringing together the experts and the centres where the expertise needs to be improved, we have a huge opportunity to genuinely address inequalities. The priority is not so much to move the patients, but to move the expertise. It is much better for a patient to be treated closer to home and get the access to the best standards of care at their local treatment centre than to have to move to another country or another centre. And the, net, the ERN PEDCAN have harnessed all the expertise across Europe to make that expertise available. But the sustainability of being able to deliver this across uh, Europe is absolutely essential. And we really call on the EU for Health to be instrumental in ensuring the sustainability. For example, we have, as a, a community in the ERN, are in the process of defining the best standard of care for all the common childhood cancer diseases, which will act as a benchmark for any European country to say, this is how any cancer in a child should be treated. And we need to make sure that our national services meet these needs. And so these are important instruments that the ERN can support. The second uh, pillar of our recommendations for the EU for Health is a medicines innovation. And I'm not so much going to focus on the research for the innovation, but the infrastructure to allow access to this innovation. We are aware that within Europe, there is an EU cross-border healthcare directive, but the limitations of the directive are for standard healthcare. And for some treatments, they are only available in the context of a clinical trial. And therefore, and this is currently not covered by the, the regulations, the S2 mechanism of reimbursement excludes clinical trials. And we believe that uh, to allow children who have relapsed, who do not have access to any further cure, uh, standard treatment to cure their, their, the malignancy, they need to be able to go to centres of expertise where these very specialist clinical trials are ongoing and allow that to happen under the social security system. So we call on the S2 mechanism for reimbursement to be reconsidered to allow the inclusion of these types of clinical trials. The other area that has been a major focus over the last decade is the EU paediatric regulation. The EU paediatric regulation, regulation should have increased the amount of drugs available for childhood cancer, but it has failed in this target. It has been recognised by the recent report from the paediatric regulation and orphan regulation uh, released by the Commission that this regulation did not address the, the needs for childhood cancer for multiple reasons that we can discuss. But this does need to be urgently changed and new legislation, perhaps in line with the legislation uh, in the US, the Race for Life Act, that can specifically allow early phase trials to be accelerated for childhood cancer and for childhood cancer drugs to be not in competition with the adult market, but to be developed in their own right. And then finally, a legis the, the EU pharmaceutical strategy, which has just been uh, out for consultation, is a huge opportunity to allow accessibility and affordability of the new agents as they come through into the rare paediatric context. 
So the EU for Health can be an opportunity to support a coordinated action to identify these bottlenecks to access to innovation. And then moving on to survivorship. I have already said that over half a million young people are survivors of childhood cancer across Europe. And we need to address the long-term impact of the disease and also the treatment that are changing the lives of some of these young people. And we need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to allow them to maximize their opportunities in life. And so there needs to be continuity of care from active treatment where all the frameworks are there to deliver their treatment to active follow-up of these survivors. The EU has invested in several research and infrastructure frameworks, working with PanCare, Sciop Europe and CCI Europe over the last years to actually look at how this could be delivered. And there is now the Survivorship Passport, which is a project that was led by the University of Genoa in partnership with PanCare and CCI Europe and Sciop Europe, which is a personalized electronic tool to guide health professionals on how to manage these young people. This incorporates long-term surveillance guidelines tailored to individual patient needs, dependent on the disease that, from which they were diagnosed and the treatment they received. And so we need to harness these tools and establish models of follow-up care of delivery to allow young people to transition from active treatment, from, the, from pediatrics through to long-term adult services. Some countries have already done this extremely well in Europe, but in other countries, it has barely been developed. And so having the tools available, we can now call on EU for Health to provide the support for good practice sharing and collaborative approaches to allow us to actually implement these solutions for children with cancer. And our final call is in the area of patient empowerment. There are a number of areas where the journey from diagnosis through to survival impacts on the lives of children, young people and their families. At the early stages, when a child is diagnosed with cancer, most employers are incredibly understanding and allow areas, uh, uh, periods of, of time off from work um, uh, in paid leave. But after a few days or weeks, many employers don't understand that childhood cancer treatments are not just a couple of days, but can be months, three months, six months, a year, sometimes two years. And this, the economic impact on a parent and the risk of losing their employment during this uh, period is real. And so we want to build on the parental leave di directive to facilitate parents to have extended periods of paid leave to support the care of their child during the treatment for cancer. For the child that goes on to an adult, having been treated and survived their cancer, Many of them live with the consequences of that when they try to, for example, get insurance for travel, insurance for mortgages, for houses, to ch their choice of employment, because they constantly have to put on forms, I had cancer, and what the consequences of that could be. So in some countries, they've implemented the legislation of the right to be forgotten, that you do not have to constantly say, I had cancer as a child. And we'd like this to be a principle across all of the Europe, in all EU member states, that this right to be forgotten is part of the infrastructure of the legislation. I'm often reminded by our parents and patient uh, groups that nothing about us without us is the mantra that we need to remember. And parent, patient and survivor organisations are the groups that tell us where we are doing well and where we are not doing well. And we need to make sure that they are fully engaged in anything that we do from healthcare delivery through to research. And we'd like to see that this representation at every governance level is facilitated in every EU member state. And this is an opportunity for EU for Health to really boost the effectiveness of engagement of paediatric cancer patient and parent organisations in everything that concerns children, young people with cancer, their families and survivors. So this is my final slide. I'm not going to read through all this, but this is this detailed summary of our recommendations for the EU for Health investment to address the inequalities from diagnosis through treatment and to survivorship. 
to sustain the ERNs, to facilitate a framework for clinical trials to be delivered across the EU and ensure access to innovation for all our children, to ensure good, equitable, long-term survival surveillance and care transition throughout Europe, and then to ensure that parents and children are included in all decisions about healthcare and uh, their management through the parent patient organizations. I thank you for your attention. Thank you um, to Prof Keynes for that um, uh, presentation and those recommendations at the end. Um, and I would like to focus on a couple of issues that you mentioned and that we as European Parliament have been insisting so much about, particularly when it comes also um, to the need to change urgently also the EU pediatric regulations um, and also the need to address more properly the inequalities in childhood cancers in terms of the availability of treatments across the different member states and also the quality of these treatments across the member states and in terms of actual um, drug development. And I'm glad that you also spoke about the issue of insurances that a number um, of uh, cancer survivors are facing. Um, I experienced it in my own member state. I'm sure that many other MEPs experience it also in different member states. And I believe that we need to have also a harmonized approach and really push hard for change um, on that issue. Now, before moving on to our panelists and also the Q&A, I would like to let you know that we will also be presenting a poll to which you can vote um, on the recommendations. Um, so we'll be presenting you with that as well. But we can pass straight away to the first panel um, that we will be having this morning. So with us this morning for the first panel, we have three panelists. I know it is a very sensitive topic, but I would like to ask you to kindly stick to three minutes each so that we can allow also for some questions from our audience. Um, and to start with, so the panelists for the first round are MEP Christian Silvio Buzio, um, Paolo Guglielmetti, who is uh, from DG Santa from the European Commission, and also Susanna Tomasikova from Childhood Cancer Switzerland. I will start st straight away with MEP Christian Silvio Buzio, who's also the reporter for the EU for Health dossier. Um, thanks for being with us. Um, uh, from your perspective, I would like to know um, what do you think about the recommendations? Um, is there anything else also from the work that you're currently doing that should be addressed by the program? And obviously, um, you know, that time is of the essence. I would like to kindly ask you to limit your intervention to two minutes. Hello, good morning. Yes, I will do it. And we are very much in Parliament to uh, stick to the time and to concentrate as much as possible the interventions. So thank you very much for inviting me and congratulations <clears throat> for this very important initiative. I would like to thank uh, for organizing the debate today on such an important topic for all of us. Paving the way for our next generation uh, is first ensuring they are in good health and stay healthy. Data shows that more than 35,000 children and young people are diagnosed with cancer and over than 6,000 young patients die annually in Europe, which is extremely unfortunate. First, uh, it is very important to underline once again that uh, we need to understand that pediatric cancers are a collection of age and biologically specific rare malignancies that cannot be appropriately addressed by extrapolation of adult cancer approaches and require a dedicated effort across the research and care continuum. We need to work towards creating a mechanism for cross-speciality capacity building and continuous education and training of healthcare professionals in the area of cancer screening and early diagnosis, but also treatment protocols and care. There is also a lack of innovative therapies to treat children with cancer. Even for older of patent medicines used off-label on children, there are still pronounced access issues, including shortages across the union and budget limitations in some member states, like my country, Romania, as well as major differences that 
the in pain control accessibility for children undergoing treatment for cancer among, cancer, among countries. Hence, there is an urgent need to appropriately revise the regulatory environment so that the needs of children and adolescents are met. Therefore, the program EU for Health, uh, I'm the rapporteur and responsible for European Parliament, should provide actions in this regard, in particular towards a reinforced pediatric use medicinal products legislation and supporting cross-border research collaborations through appropriate allocations and uh, address also the unmet needs of children and adolescents with cancer. I can assure you that I will do all my best and I saw that uh, also the shadow rapporteurs, as we are calling uh, us, them in the European Parliament, the persons, the colleagues responsible on behalf of the other political groups are very much open to set pediatric cancer as a priority in the EU for Health, the next uh, EU program for health in European Union, with actions that will aim to address the unmet needs of children suffering and improve their access to diagnosis, care, including palliative and supportive care, and also very important, as I mentioned earlier, to innovative therapies. Also, I would uh, like to see reinforced the European reference networks into excellence networks via EU for Health program and extend them in the field of cancer and pediatric cancer in order to enable the European reference network and pre-existing research structures to achieve their full potential towards the required level of progress in this underserved area and contribute to our goal to eradicate pediatric cancer. Finally, Horizon Europe will be also a very good opportunity. I was also responsible for the health chapter of Horizon Europe and now as president of ITRE, I'm following uh, the whole program. Horizon Europe with its mission for cancer with a special focus for pediatric cancer will be a very good opportunity to uh, invest more, to improve uh, the therapies, the diagnosis, and also to discover new ways of treating pediatric cancer, cancer in children and adolescents. Thank you so much. And once again, congratulations for uh, your excellent initiative. Thanks a lot to you, um, MEP Buzio. Thanks for giving us an update on the work that has been currently carried out also on the EU for Health dossier. Um, uh, please stay with us because the panel um, is still ongoing and we'll have Q and A's um, for you as well. I would like now to give the floor to Paolo Guglielmetti. He's a member of Cancer Team at DG Santa um, European Commission. And Mr. Guglietti, uh, Guglielmetti, sorry, as you share with us your reflections on the recommendations put forward, I would like uh, to ask you also about um, the concerns that we as Parliament um, have, particularly since important programs such as the one we are dealing with um, today, um, the health program, will experience a budget cut when compared to what was originally proposed by the Commission. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And how do you think also that the programs will be affected with such a cut? Thank you, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning uh, to, to, to everybody. And uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the MIP uh, Against the Cancer Group, the participants in the European Cancer League uh, for the opportunity to have uh, this uh, exchange of views, uh, an important exchange of views in occasion of the Childhood Cancer uh, Awareness Month. But uh, let me also uh, praise the important speech of Professor Kearns, who raised imperative issues on cancer in childhood, which are also very close to our approach. Let's say I was uh, uh, really impressed by the main point of the recommendation that there, uh, also uh, mirroring uh, our intention and our expectation. In particular, discrepancies, important discrepancy in the survival of children and adolescents with cancer across the EU show that inequality must be urgent addressed. First point. Secondly, as well as uh, must be improved the access to treatment. And uh, this uh, is an issue that uh, has been repeated so many times. And uh, we know very well 
that uh, is a crucial point. Not, all, not only access to treatments, but also access to innovative diagnostic tests. New ideas, tools, and innovative applications to help a childhood cancer survivors should be developed, must be developed, and translated into a day-by-day -day practice across the EU on the basis of lessons learned from concrete action. I hear the uh, really, uh, and I was pleased, uh, the, the many examples that uh, uh, we have the material is there. Now it's time to translate uh, guidelines, uh, good practices, uh, network expertise uh, in uh, concrete uh, actions. And this uh, should be done uh, working uh, closely, as uh, closely as possible with the families of cancer patients, helping and uh, empowering them uh, to sustain their daily life close to patients uh, as well as in their working environment. Despite the significant challenges the poised that the coronavirus crisis, uh, the Europe's beating cancer plan remains a top priority for the Commission. And the timeline for adoption of the plan remains unchanged on the fourth quarter of this year. And our expectation are that uh, all the issues and challenges so brilliantly presented by Professor Kearns will be addressed. And, uh, will have a, a privileged place in, in the plan. Obviously, by the European Beating Cancer Plan with the support of the EU for Health New Program and the other funding instrument of, of the Commission. Um, I hope now to manage a, a, a very uh, quick slide show on the main points. The first slide, please. And uh, as you see, the EU Cancer Plan, as you know, uh, propose action for all stages uh, of the disease. And uh, uh, pediatric cancer are cross-cutting all these stages, as also Professor Kills uh, has, has underlined, from prevention to survivorship through early detection, diagnosis, uh, and treatment. Slide two, please. And the Youth for Health new program will tackle major threats to health, including those of relevance for children and adolescents. Slide three, please. But now we come to the, uh, to the topic concerning how can the Youth for Health new program improve access to diagnosis, treatment, and care for pediatric cancer patients. I can tell you that there is a strong emphasis on giving a relevant support in terms of funding in the program to pediatric cancer, as well as in the cancer plan. And following also the logic of the cancer plan that is looking not only to the short and medium term, but to the longer term and sustainability of the action. And the work is progressing uh, on developing ideas uh, for spending uh, under the new program. Also, thanks uh, to the open consultation, which has received uh, around 2,400 contributions. Now, we will, of course, continue the stakeholder consultation, and uh, we will focus on pediatric cancer based uh, on the cancer plan. And in the Horizon Europe, there will be investment linked to the cancer mission, and uh, as uh, will explain my colleagues from research and, and development. But the exact detail of individual projects cannot be taken for granted at this stage. And then once the budget will be fixed, there will be a better understanding of the margin of maneuver to propose potential concrete actions. But uh, as I heard, and uh, as you know, all the elements, all the bricks of this future, uh, let's say, challenge construction are there and uh, ready to be used to uh, decide which activities and project can be funded. For example, in the area of prevention, uh, through raising the coverage of vaccination against the human papillomavirus and hepatitis B, as well as fighting obesity, 
and the promoting healthy diets and the lifestyles to finding innovative way of implementing the European Code Against Cancer that uh, one time more needs to be translated in concrete action. Or through the revision of orphan drugs and pediatric medicine directive, as already mentioned, and the pharma, for the pharma package and strategy is due before the end of the year and will be a very powerful instrument to strengthening and to improve the access to treatment and innovative diagnostics. And the use of the European health data space will be very relevant, will provide other possibility, for instance, for cancer registries, for example, and data monitoring, which will be instrumental to follow up of cancer survivors, as also has been spotted out as a, as a priority. In addition, through the continuous support provided also by the Joint Research Center in the area of quality of cancer services, as well as the extension, as it was spotted also, of the European reference networks that uh, will be strengthened. And through potential initiative to support the quality of life uh, of children and adolescents with cancer, their families and cancer survivors through federating, for example, the so many excellent experience and the efforts done across the EU. Uh, the, the fourth slide, please. In addition to the EU for Health program, there will be other funding streams. For example, the European Social Fund Plus or the European Regional and Development Fund to improve regional health infrastructure, as has been spotted uh, as, a, as an issue that can help the organization of the treatment of uh, pediatric cancer across the EU. But uh, we need also to know that the several initiatives, several other initiatives are already underway, such as the One Million Genome Initiative, or the ongoing work of the Commission Joint Research Center to further develop and improve collaboration among European cancer registries, for example, on pediatric cancer. I think it's now time to finish, but it's not a conclusion. As you see, there is an open space waiting not only for new ideas, but for concrete actions. Thank you, um, Mr. Guglielmetti, for your presentation. And uh, I would have to reiterate a point that we are really concerned about um, as Parliament, and I'm sure that many of the stakeholders are concerned about as well, because if we really want to push change and if we really want to do all that is necessary to make sure that we address pediatric cancer, then we need to have the funding for that um, and the budget cuts that we were presented with on such an important programme as the health programme are really concerning um, to us because we can have on paper all the brilliant ideas and the will to actually push but then we need to make sure that we put money um, where our mouth is and make sure that we have money for such programs um, which brings me now to Zuzanna uh, Tomashikova she's a patient advocate she's a cancer survivor um, she's uh, representing childhood cancer Switzerland which represents childhood cancer international um, Europe and in such a panel it is always extremely important to have the patient's perspective. So Susanna, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and the opportunity to represent Childhood Cancer International Europe in this meeting. Childhood Cancer International Europe, CCI Europe reunites childhood cancer parents and survivors organization in Europe, which are meanwhile 65 organizations in 32 European countries. And the aim is to help children and adolescents to be cured with no or as few as possible long-term health problems. As an active member of CCI Europe, I do extensively support the recommendation presented by Professor Pamela Kearns. Additionally, I would like to emphasize the important role of parents and survivor organization in general. These NGOs provide vital and comprehensive support for 
young patients and their families. And their active involvement and collaboration with the healthcare professionals within the European Reference on Network on Pediatric Cancer is really crucial. This holistic approach can guarantee the overall success of the ERNs and giving the full potential when addressing the inequalities in the survival of patients affected of childhood cancer across Europe. eu for health could ensure that parents and survivors' organizations are empowered and adequately researched to perceive this role, not only in cross-border healthcare, but also on national level, carrying out the support the families need and enable so far the patient access, especially to ERNs. As a survivor representative at Childhood Cancer Survivor myself, I also have to stress the necessity of multidisciplinary long-term follow-up care. As we heard in the previous presentations, the community is really growing, half a million of European citizens but 60 to 70% of the survivors deal with delayed effects in the daily life due to the treatment or to the cancer itself. This impedes the participation and also limits the extent of our contribution to the society. eu for health could support the further development on the field on the long-term follow-up care. We already heard the Pan-European Network, PanCare, is extremely active and work closely together with CCI Europe and SIOB Europe, especially on survivorship issues. One of the projects, Survivorship Passport, is meanwhile a good practice tool to empower survivors in shared decision-making and also provides a plan for personalized long-term follow-up care. Together with access to long-term follow-up clinics and appropriate psychosocial care, it can ensure a better quality of life for all survivors. But we've heard that the levels of unrolling and implementation is really different across Europe. eu for health could fac facilitate the implementation and also improve the socioeconomic rights for patients and survivors. Thank you. Thank you, um, dear Zuzanna, for that insight from the patient's perspective um, as well. I would like now to ask all the attendees to please uh, let us know if you have any questions that you would like um, to share with us. I'm seeing um, a couple of questions that we can um, come to straight away. Um, again, I would like to remind everyone about the poll. Um, which you can access by logging into slido.com with the hashtag shine gold. So hashtag shine gold. Um, you can join um, also our poll um, by going there, slido.com hashtag shine gold, where we are asking you which of the presented recommendations should receive the highest priority in the EU for health program. And we are giving you the options, including foster improved access to innovative therapies, um, address inequalities in the survival of children and adolescents with cancer, um, whether you prefer to facilitate the rollout of long-term surveillance and care transition or foster sustained livelihood for parents with children with cancer. Again, join us there on slido.com, hashtag shine gold. We have also um, a barcode that you can scan and access um, the poll, which would make life easier um, for everyone. So let's have a quick look at the questions which you are directing to our panelists. I remind you once again that with us we have MEP Buzio, um, who is the rapporteur for the EU for Health programme, Mr. Paolo Guglielmetti, who is from the European Commission, and also Susanna Tomasikova, who is a patient survivor. Um, I know that uh, Professor Pam Keynes uh, made her own recommendations in the beginning, and our panelists referred to those recommendations, which we find extremely helpful. Um, if I can ask Professor Keynes um, your first thoughts after hearing the panelists, um, if what you heard today confirms 
what you have been working on um, and if you believe that the recommendations presented can actually address the issues that our panelists um, uh, presented um, just now. Thank, thank you, Miriam. Uh, I was really um, heartened to hear the comments by all the discussants. Uh, it's very clear to see that the message of the needs of childhood cancer and for the um, young people and survivors it is really landing uh, uh, with, with the MEPs and with the Commission. Um, our recommendations, uh, I noticed in the Slido that people are being asked to put a priority. I think the difficulty with prioritising them is that they are all interlinked. Um, you know, I think the, the one that is coming out as most popular is the addressing the inequalities of survival of childhood cancer. But those inequalities go right the way through. I, I, um, I think one of the discussants made the point that it's not just about treatment, it's diagnostics and right through to survivorship. So I think with the, the, the comments that are made about the different ways, the different instruments that could allow these changes to be facilitated by EU for Health have to be integrated so that it isn't just one part of it that's addressed, it all needs to be addressed. And, and the, um, the point made by Susanna about the absolute importance of the survivors, the patients, the, uh, the, the families, and those parent organiz those organizations being at the heart of what we do is critical because uh, in every uh, area of research that I, in which I'm engaged, the people we go to for the best advice are the families. You know, we can go for the peer review to the clever scientists, but the questions that we need to answer, and this is true of changing healthcare policy, we need to answer the needs of the people that we're trying to treat. And so they're the people who are at the centre of this. And I, I think that was very well stated by Susanna. But I, I really welcome the positive uh, response from, from, from the MEPs and from the Commission to say how we can genuinely use EU for Health putting a paediatric cancer track in, in, in every different aspect of it that is tailored for the needs of childhood cancer is very, very reassuring. If I may intervene uh, for a second. Uh, well, uh, you know that uh, initially we had a health program which was more or less the same as it happened in the past. Of course, it was welcomed, but was far from uh, or ambitious and from citizens' expectations. And anyway, it was not a separate program as part of ASF Plus. And during the last mandate, uh, I tried, but with no success, to, to have a separate program. Then COVID, COVID crisis came, and uh, uh, beside many very negative aspects, the loss of lives, the problems of the economies, the problems with uh, all the other patients, including cancer patients, which do not have now the appropriate care because uh, of the COVID, because of the lack of resources in hospitals because of the fear of being infected. Uh, at least one positive aspect was that uh, the policymakers, uh, national governments and also uh, decidants uh, saw that uh, health should become a priority and also the public opinion, the citizens. And the uh, European Commission came with a very ambitious program, uh, 9.4 billion uh, uh, and a separate program. Then uh, we had the summit of head of states and governments and uh, some compromises had to be done. One of the compromise was to not to give any money to the program from the recovery and resilience facility, but increase the previous program with the money from, from the MFF. And now we have a, a program with much more ambitious ambitions than uh, in the past and with much more expectations. I discussed with uh, Mr. Spahn, uh, the German Minister for Health, because we have the German presidency, I discussed with my colleagues from European Parliament and we have to settle some priorities. So EU for Health should be a program which is not just the continuation of the previous programs, but much more. More ambitious, with more targets, with uh, better objectives and with uh, better results. And I can assure you that cancer will be a priority. So this program will be a strong support for EU beating cancer plan of uh, uh, European Commission of uh, President von der Leyen Commissioner Kiriakides, and of course, pediatric cancer will have a special focus. What we do now in the parliament is to settle these priorities. And please, uh, I uh, make an appeal to the panelists and colleagues to look uh, now to the legislative text. I will uh, share the compromises soon with uh, everybody. 
And uh, let's focus on the text itself because we are now in the phase when we negotiate compromises, compromise amendments. We have hundreds of amendments, but we will uh, organize some compromises and you'll see there, of course, uh, the cancer and pediatric cancer. And then, of course, we have to lobby European Commission and it's important that we have now the representative of the European Commission when they will establish uh, the working program for each year to see exactly what uh, we uh, want to achieve uh, in the uh, concrete actions. Because in the Parliament we settle the priorities, but then the implementation will be at the European Commission. So in order to be efficient, uh, uh, we have to implement uh, the good principles and the good uh, objectives that uh, we are setting together into actions. And we have to, to, be, to stay in close contact together and uh, be very, very uh, involved in order to see everything done. Thank you um, uh, to MEP Buzio as well and Prof Skins about that. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Gilles Vazal, uh, board member from Stock Europe. I know that there is a question. Um, Gilles, you have the floor. I don't seem to have him here. In that case, I can do the question because um, I know um, what the question was. Um, can so you the hear question me? from Gilles, yes, now we can oh, hear okay. you. You can do the question yourself. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. I have a very simple question following your comment, Mep Miriam Jali. When the final budget for the EU for Health program will be voted, there are ongoing discussions. Yes. When this is likely to be voted uh, in the EU? Maybe I should direct that question to MEP Buzio, who is the rapporteur for the EU um, for Health program. But also, um, maybe it would be interesting to get the point of view. Um, of the chair um, of uh, MAC, Lucas Forla. I will give the floor first to MP Buzio, your... Please, um, uh, I was, I'm not sure that you. well uh, the, the question. Can you please, uh, Madame Dali, just uh, summarize? Uh, I, I yes, yes. He's asking um, when will there be a final vote on the um, funding of the EU for Health program to put it in, uh, in, in, in a summarized way, when the final EU for Health budget is planned to be voted? Well, uh, of course, we have uh, the report in the Parliament. We will uh, intend to vote um, in October, in one of the sessions of October, uh, probably the second uh, voting session. But the final budget will be the result of negotiations with the Council. So uh, what I discussed uh, briefly and uh, informally with the Minister Spahn was to try to increase a little bit the budget. We don't have a large uh, uh, space for maneuver because you know that the negotiations were very tough in the Council at the highest level, the heads of uh, governments and states. Uh, so uh, no big differences will be possible. But EU for Health is one of the priorities of European Parliament and there is uh, an openness between member states to see a little bit uh, an adjustment, a positive adjustment of the budget. So uh, we'll vote in October in the Parliament and uh, we'll know maybe November, December, after the trilogues and the negotiations, what will be the final budget. Process in the morning, process Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, then uh, starting with the 1st of uh, January next year, the implementation will start. Thank you. Thank you, MEP Buzio. Uh, I don't know if uh, MEP Fula would like to come in. Lucas? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, I will, I will need only 30 seconds just to repeat that uh, uh, I don't know what will be with the budget, but uh, three days ago I had a short meeting with uh, uh, Commissioner of Health, Selek Piragidis, and uh, she ensured me that there will not be any cuts in the uh, cancer plan, which is very positive for us. Uh, yes, Veronique Trielenoir, Miriam, may I? Yes, yes, Veronique, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Sorry for being late. Um, I, I, I am a little bit confused with the financial aspects of all these programs. Uh, maybe because I'm not very good at figures, but anyway, uh, Lucas, hi, Lucas, you just mentioned that the commissioner ensured you that there would be no cuts in the cancer plan. Does it mean that there could be a specific budget for the cancer plan? I'm not talking about legislative modifications. I'm really talking about budget. So Christian, Lucas, everybody, do you understand that there could be two separate budgets, one for EU for health, so global inclusive one, including rare diseases and cancers and pediatric cancers, and the other one for the cancer beating plan. I know about Mission Europe. I am quite sure that the research part will be financed, but how do you understand the repartition between this money left for else? Could you help me understand? Because right now I don't anymore. If I may. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, will, uh, I will just give the floor quickly to MEP Buzio and just to address this concern because it's a concern of many. Veronica, I understand you um, completely, but we're running late, 20 minutes late. I was informed. I, so, brief. MEP what, Buzio, what, a quick reaction. What, what we are doing now uh, is to discuss the general figure of you for health. And this is also the matter of negotiation with the Council. Then European Commission on having the general figure for the next seven years will uh, we'll prepare an action plan for each year. And here we have to decide in the Parliament if we'll have any role uh, as a matter of uh, involvement of the European Parliament to, to adopt, to, to approve uh, uh, the annual plan or to have a, a role. Uh, we'll see exactly what will be our role. But uh, uh, what, how the money will be divided between different initiatives like EU cancer plan, the digitalization, uh, the other actions that European Commission are planning and are among our priorities, because we settled the uh, legislative and policy priorities, this will be the role of European Commission. That's yeah. why uh, Madam Commissioner, which is very much committed to support uh, your beating cancer plan and extremely active, gave, uh, gave uh, the assurance to Mr. Furlas. Uh, uh, I know that you have a very close relationship and you work with her very closely, that your beating cancer plan will not, be, yeah. will not have cuts. We'll have a uh, stockpiling out because uh, this was not possible anymore, the strategic ones for the future. We'll have cuts in the, what, what I was explained, in the digital programs because they were very ambitious, but they cannot do all the programs. We did budget cut it, but not you beating cancer plan. The figures yes. are not definitive, but there are uh, European Commission which will decide uh, which action, which money, for how many years. Uh, is that's why we don't see the legislation. I, I know, if yes. I may. This, devising, this device between different uh, projects. I will be very short. I will be very, very short. Very short, please. Uh, to, yes, to answer Veronique. Uh, uh, we, yes, we didn't get in details with uh, the commissioner, but I get the intention of her that she, uh, she will give fight so we don't have any cuts to EU cancer plan. This is uh, the intention of the commissioner. And we're going to help him uh, uh, in any ways. But we didn't get any details about uh, what is going to cut or not. Bottom line is, let's make sure that we do not uh, end up with uh, just words um, and not have really money where we should have money to actually make people life better. I know that Carmelo Rizzari, president-elect of South Europe, um, raised the hand. I don't know, Carmelo, if you'll manage to do your intervention in just one minute. I only have one minute. Um, if you want to come on this point, um, otherwise, we would have to leave this point for later. I'm sure that this issue will um, crop up later on. Carmelo Rizzari, if you want to come in quickly. No, it doesn't seem. Maybe then um, Mr. Rizzari will uh, join later on this issue. If you may allow me just before we close off this panel, which was interesting, and the points we discussed, I'm sure we'll have much more discussions about them because I believe that we're all um, on the same wavelength, but let's make sure that the words that we are told or the words that there are um, on paper actually do happen um, in reality. I will mind, remind you once again about 
um, the poll that we are holding. Join us at slido.com, hashtag shine gold. Um, currently, the foster improved access to innovative therapies is the most recommendation that people are giving its highest priority. Um, second to that is address inequalities in the survival of children and adolescents with cancer. Thank you for this opportunity to moderate this um, first panel. I will pass on the floor straight away to Professor Christine Homian, Vice Chair of the Cancer Mission Board of Horizon um, Europe. You have the floor um, and thank you once again for your interventions. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, listening in. Thank you, of course, uh, to the MEPs Against Cancer, Veronique, Lucas, for uh, giving us all the opportunity to exchange on this uh, very important subject of pediatric cancer. Uh, on behalf of the Mission uh, Board on Cancer, I will uh, rapidly highlight our role and our work so far, and of course, uh, dwell more specifically uh, on the work that we have done addressing uh, today's uh, topic. So I'll try and get all this working. Share by slide. Right, this should be working. Right. Uh, so just to dwell a bit upon uh, the missions, um, in uh, Horizon Europe, there's uh, this new project, uh, which is uh, supplementary to the standard uh, let's say, uh, tools uh, of uh, the framework, and these are the, the missions. Uh, there's uh, quite a number of reports and studies which have been published since 2018, uh, which have described uh, the mission-oriented uh, research and innovation approach that has been added uh, in Horizon Europe. Um, as I said, it's a supplementary tool to program research and innovation. And the quote of Professor Mariana Matsukato, which is here, uh, missions are uh, aimed to provide a solution, an opportunity and an approach to address the numerous challenges that people face in their daily lives. And most specifically, um, the missions are here to give directions to the European research and innovation, uh, not only in solving pressing society's sad challenges, but the more difficult is to produce tangible results. And most importantly, and we've heard already the role of empowerment, uh, the role of the mission and of the goal is to involve citizens and stakeholders more closely in setting uh, research uh, priorities. Why a mission on cancer? Well, I think we're not in the, uh, in the situation here that I need to explain everything to you. Uh, you all know that cancer is one of Europe's top five major societal challenges. The number of new cancer cases diagnosed is projected to increase by 25% by 2035. And of course, we've heard it already how important it is. Europe needs better and equitable prevention, diagnosis, treatment, care, survivor rates, and of course, post-quality, post-cancer quality of life. So all five missions have uh, a board uh, of 15 uh, experts, uh, which leans on an extra um, board assembly of uh, around 30 experts. Uh, at the Mission Board of Cancer, uh, the chair is Professor Walter Ricciardi. We have the 13 other members, uh, which have our different expertise. We have one patient on, of cancer, we have a patient representative, and those of you who are all here know, of course, Ruth Leidenstein's role in pediatric cancer. As I said, we are helped by uh, 26 members of the assembly, uh, also of different expertise, patient organization, and those of you who also know uh, Patricia Blanc knows that she's part uh, of our assembly. So the board members have worked together asking for regular feedbacks from the assembly, from the member states, the shadow committee cancer subgroup. We also have meetings with uh, members of the parliament. Uh, ETRA invited us. Uh, and we've also had regular nearly monthly uh, meetings with commissioner Mariana Gabriel. The mission board produced at the end of the June, 25th of June, or I could also say delivered after nine months, uh, with all the other uh, mission boards, a draft outline of what we wish to achieve to make conquering cancer a mission possible. 
So in line with the mission approach criteria, we have set a specific target, which is by 2013 to have more than 3 million lives saved, but also living longer and better. To reach the targets, we have identified five intervention areas, prevention, diagnosis and treatment, quality of life. And you can see in the diagram, which represents something which could look like, I don't know, a, a Greek theater, excuse me, all the Greek participants. Um, the, it's important that we have, uh, let's say, a common uh, floor, which is understanding, which will help to uh, move forward in the three pillars prevention, diagnosis and treatment and quality of life. And we also have added a roof, which is uh, throughout the, uh, the three, of course, pillars, is uh, equitable access uh, to all. Now to uh, reach and help us uh, de define uh, these uh, intervention areas to reach our goal, uh, we have identified uh, three, 13 recommendations uh, for bold actions and all this uh, is, of course, uh, publicly available, and I am sure that you have already uh, read them. So just to highlight uh, rapidly the titles of these 13 recommendations, uh, they relate to the five intervention areas. Of course, uh, one recommendation can lead uh, to different, uh, let's say, intervention areas, and uh, more than one recommendation can help a deliver one intervention area. Um, I've, I think it's important that I go through them uh, because of course uh, they are addressing uh, all cancers, uh, including of course childhood cancers and adolescent and young adults facing cancer. We have one of course uh, which is called UNCAN, which is to understand uh, cancer better. Uh, we need to innovate, we need to think out of the box. This would be a European platform gathering the existing information and spurring uh, interdisciplinary research. We would like to develop an EU-wide research program to identify polygenic risk scores, support the development and implementation of effective cancer prevention strategies and policies, optimize ex existing screening programs, and of course develop novel approaches, advance and implement personalized medicine approaches, develop early diagnosis, and link to that, of course, minimally invasive technologies and treatment, develop an EU-wide research program and policy support to improve the quality of life of cancer patients, survivors, the family members and care carers, but also all patients or persons who are facing with an increased risk of cancer. Create a European Cancer pa Patient Digital Centre where cancer patients and survivors can deposit and share their data, know where they can find their data, but also where they can find information uh, to monitor their health and if they wish, the possibility to share their data. Achieve cancer health equity, we've heard it already here, throughout the continuum of the disease, Set up a network of comprehensive cancer infrastructures. It's not automatically buildings. It's not automatically just cancer care centers. It's an infrastructure which brings together research, education, and care to increase quality uh, in all uh, member states uh, in these issues. We have three uh, cross-cutting uh, recommendations. Recommendation 11, which I will dwell a bit more later on, on childhood cancer. One which is also to accelerate innovation and create oncology-focused living labs to be able to bring a new mission-oriented approach to innovation. And we believe that the cross-cutting action of make all our health policy insurers and of course uh, citizens aware that cancer is not the cancer they used to know 30, 50 years ago. We need to accompany, transform culture, cancer culture, do uh, communication uh, throughout uh, the citizens and uh, child children, and of course, uh, assure capacity building for uh, expertise and uh, quality of care. 
As you can see, these 13 recommendations for actions are citizen and patient-centered recommendations for action. And of course, uh, they will link on existing uh, EU initiatives, and we have heard about uh, ERN's uh, excellent role so far. And of course, uh, we will uh, synergize with actions uh, of the uh, European Speaking Cancer Plan, uh, which we uh, already have uh, heard of uh, earlier this morning. So the, all, as I've said, are recommendations and our goal aim to address all types of cancers and all specific requirements and needs of patients, whatever their age, their country and uh, their social uh, characteristics. Uh, we believe that it was important to have a dedicated recommendation that addresses childhood cancers, cancers in adolescents and young adults, cure more and cure better. The need, we've heard Pamela Kearns already highlighted and the previous speakers, I will just go through probably the same but said maybe a bit differently. Once again, these children, adolescents are not just small adults. We just know, don't need to divide the doses by the, uh, the weight and the height. The vast majority of their cancers are different from all adult cancers. Their cancer develops early in life and it's not related to the well-known uh, long-term processes of additional mutations that we find in adults. Multiple cancer types are unique for this very young population and it requires specific epidemiological, biological, clinical research considerations and innovations. I'll highlight, highlight also what has already been said. In the last decade, there's been more than 150 new anti-cancer drugs in the adult sector but only 6% for pediatric views. And although cure rates improved impressively over the, over the last decades, within the dedicated pediatric cancers network we've talked about, it's usually systematically all drugs, mostly off-label that have been used in concerted treatment protocols. They still come at a high uh, burden risk uh, with more than 60% late effect burden require long-term health observations and interventions. It's not just the months and the years, it's the whole lifelong after uh, the cancer, which is important. And of course, I'll underscore the lifelong societal and geographical disadvantages based on the cancer history that needs to be rectified. So these are society members, which are our children and our young adults at the European level, are a vulnerable uh, population. They call for equity and need our special attention. And thank you once again for allowing us to discuss this important topic together today. So uh, we have at the mission board uh, identified so far more than 20 uh, suggested actions uh, for this recommendation. There can be actions on research and innovation, but there are also actions on support, policy actions, capacity building actions, and actions on infrastructures and platforms. For the moment, uh, we have grouped uh, these as more than 20 suggested actions in these five overarching uh, actions. One, to accelerate the development of therapeutic innovations, and I've highlighted in red what needs to be done, the action, and it does need a new regulatory environment. We need to innovate. Ensure equal access to modern diagnosis and essential anti-cancer medicine based on standard treatment plans of good quality, but also including complex interventions and, also, and linked to uh, an increased uh, knowledge uh, by having a a cancer, um, children cancer case registration. We need to understand better these difficult specific cancer childhood specificity. We need to have a dedicated research and we would wish to lean on the big data generation and the mathematical uh, discipline to uh, understand and innovate uh, in understanding cancer in this population. Of course, this cannot be done without fostering capacity building, both in the care, in the, in the health policy, 
uh, and also uh, in uh, the uh, research setting. And of course, we can lean on existing ERNN's uh, successes. Last, uh, we would like to ensure safe transition of these uh, childhood cancer survivors into adult life. These needs to empower patient-centric support tools and healthcare structures and also improved uh, legislations. However, for the moment, we have not published uh, any of our actions. We are still fulfilling a strong consultation of the recommendations that we have just uh, published. This consultation leans on citizens, patients and carers, also links on member states' authorities, EU and national stakeholders, the European Commission, uh, I think nearly all uh, DJs, and of course, uh, the members of the European Parliament with which uh, we uh, discuss as often as we can, and today is a good uh, opportunity. So, so far, um, this slide summarizes our activities since the publication of the draft. And uh, we have tried to cover in the last three months and uh, with uh, the COVID crisis context, uh, as much as all the European uh, member states uh, as possible. As you can see here, we have met, made meetings with citizens of different member states in their own country and in their own language, or we have met and got together citizens and patients in small groups uh, in English. On the right, you can see the board as ambassadors. Each member of the board is an ambassador for one or two or three countries. And we have also uh, made uh, different uh, uh, meetings uh, in each member states with the ministries of research, health, economics or education, citizens engagements, meeting with national and EU stakeholders. We have, of course, uh, su the support of the assembly main members when this was deemed difficult. And we have taken into account all the many written published reports from a wide range of stakeholders, private, academic, patient organizations, uh, and of course, um, associations like those which are present here today, for which we thank uh, their input. There is also uh, an ongoing survey, and I've given you the link here, of the EU missions, uh, which is uh, we are waiting uh, for your input uh, from all the citizens for these missions. I will finish by saying that uh, I strongly believe that the mission oriented research and innovation approach is a novel opportunity that will synergize with the standard Horizon Europe actions and uh, with the uh, combined uh, synergy with the European beating cancer plan will boost EU efforts uh, to conquer cancer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Professor uh, Chamien. Uh, um, I'm Petra de Sutter and I'm very happy to be able to moderate this uh, second uh, session. Um, we are running uh, late, as you all have noticed, but I was informed that we can go a little bit um, over time, although I will have to uh, manage the time uh, strictly. So we've heard actually a lot of things that were already addressed in the first session, but now uh, looked at from an angle of uh, research and innovation with some accents, accents on registration, data management, transition strategies, uh, and um, of course, um, patient participation patient if I summarize very shortly uh, what was said and thank you for this presentation. In our panel today we have two participants. We do not have someone, someone representing the Commission unfortunately. Um, that person could not make it but we have um, a member of Parliament, uh, Maria Spiraki from EPP, a Greek member who is also a member of E3, of course the committee responsible for research and innovation, and Angelo Ricci, president of the Italian Parents Association, also a member of Childhood Cancer International Europe, um, as Susanna before. So these two uh, uh, persons will now uh, make their statements. I really have to ask you to stick to uh, three minutes, you will understand, to have some time for discussion afterwards. Maria, the floor is yours, please.
You hear me now? Thank you very much for having me in this so very important and very, very interesting uh, exchange of views. I would like just to, to stick on the issue of, uh, of Horizon Europe, uh, speaking frankly. And I would like to say that now we are lacking of funding and at the same time we are lacking of data. And we have to take into account that we cannot go forward with innovative therapies and having research and innovation with our own terms and focusing on pediatric cancer without having the proper funding. In this regard, I would like to say that it is our first fight in the Parliament in order to increase the funding to, to Horizon Europe and in order to have a proper funding for research and innovation. And of course, Concerning pediatric cancer, it is important to exploit the artificial intelligence potential for pediatric cancers to gain new insights in pediatric cancer genesis, development and cure. It is of paramount importance to ensure best possible follow-up care, research and empowerment of childhood cancer survivors as a growing EU population. And I would like to say that I'm not an expert, but I fully endorse the, the European Society for Pediatrics Oncology Strategy Plan that includes innovative therapies, precision medicine and healthcare, increased biology knowledge of pediatric tumors, increased equal access to standard care, to expertise, to clinical research, because we have a lot of inequalities within EU as well, and the way to address the needs of teenagers and young adults, because we have to focus also in survivors. Once again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this so interesting exchange of views. Thank you, Maria. So please, um, you have the floor, Angelo. Thank you so much. Many thanks to MIP's uh, Head of Cancer and to uh, European Cancer Leagues for organizing this webinar. I am the father of Camilla, my first daughter who died for a lymphoma in, back in 1993. I have now the honor and the pleasure to speak on behalf of CCI Europe in a parent's perspective. We warmly welcome the mention of pediatric cancer in recommendation 11 of the interim report. Cure more and cure better is indeed the, a statement who sums up well our expectation and our goals. Thank you, Professor Chemien, for uh, having so brightly highlighted many points that uh, are very important to us. I'm now emphasizing some topics that I find relevant and maybe you all too. The first is uh, this one. 6,000 young lives interrupted every year. It's uh, like uh, a small country, a small village. So remember it when you are deciding what to fund and how. The second, as you know, uh, a very large part of drugs used in pediatric oncology is has been developed and licensed for adults. But as we have heard, children are not miniature adults. You can't just reduce doses proportionally. The organism is still in development and drugs have much more serious effects. Did you know then that in the last, you heard that in the last years, more than 150 new drugs have been developed for adults versus only nine for children. This also means that many of the drugs currently used are old. Would you use an old uh, phone uh, with no connection, internet connection, connection instead of your smartphone? Will you give quinine to your child uh, if he gets fever? I don't think so. Therefore, there is an absolute need of uh, of new drugs, especially developed for children, more effective, safer, and with less or better, with no uh, effects, late effects at all. Adequate policies should be put in place to achieve this goal. About side effects, we, we heard that, uh, uh, that we know about losing hair, and this moves our heart, but what we do not, many do not know is that the toxicity of drugs and treatments may cause serious late effects. Two thirds of pediatric cancer survivors risk to develop a second tumor or other life threatening diseases and will experience a lower quality of life than their peer. Only by setting up long term follow up uh, protocols, uh, hopefully adopting the mentioned uh, survivorship passport it will be possible to prevent the onset of this disease. I go finishing. Once I heard childhood cancer described as a tsunami, 
the image gives us a good description of what happens in a family when a child is diagnosed with cancer. We can say that all the family gets sick. Moreover, the disease can generate poverty. One of the parents, if not both of them, risk losing his job. Sometimes it's necessary to move for treatment and the family splits up. There are psychological and consequences for all family members and especially for the most fragile ones, the children. It is therefore necessary that policies are implemented in all member states to support and protect the family during illness and possibly afterward, especially in case of living family. I'm finishing. Time for recommendation is now over. It's now time for action. Horizon Europe can really improve access to quality, quality diagnosis, treatment and care for pediatric cancer patients. You, you, MEPs against cancer, can make really a difference and contribute to, to a significant progress in pediatric oncology throughout Europe in its various aspects, research, treatment, care, social support. We are counting on you to ensure that, as a recommendation number 11 states, children and adolescents with cancer will be cured more and cured better. The dedicated CCI Europe Working Group has prepared a position paper containing numerous practical indications to achieve this goal. This document is put at your disposal with humility and respect, but also with passion to give you useful suggestions for your important legislative work. Please make it your own. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angelo, for yeah, um, telling us what it is really um, about um, very concretely. Thank you. Um, I can uh, give uh, the floor to people wanting to ask questions. I am informed that there is also here uh, on Slido a poll uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be taken. So please, um, you are invited to do so and we will then uh, at the end uh, discuss uh, the results. Um, on Slido as well, there were already two questions that were not addressed yet. And I think one was definitely um, touching upon what, um, what was uh, discussed by Angelo about the psychological support of parents and caregivers of child patients or pediatric support, even palliative care even. Um, but the second question, and I would maybe ask Maria if she wants to comment on that, is if there should not be more focus on prevention and promotion through the public health sector. Um, Maria or Angelo uh, or anyone else who wants to take the floor and maybe address this point as it was raised in the Slido. Please take the floor. Or um, of course, Pamela, yes, um, you are absolutely invited to take the floor if you want to address this. Go ahead. Uh, can I? Yes, absolutely. If oh, I Maria may... first. Yes, Maria, you can first, of course. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much for giving me the floor back. It is of paramount importance to engage people. And I think this is the case for us, as well as uh, to, to increase funding and to support the, the, uh, the way that we can tackle pediatric cancer. And starting by engaging people, it is important to, 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 to take people on board in our, in our communication strategy as members of the, of the, of the, of the, com of the Committee of Europe Beating Cancer. It is important to explain to our constituencies, to our, to our member states, that we have uh, to have all the, the available data uh, on board in order to, have, uh, to, to, to support the, the, the innovation and in order to have innovative treatments. And at the same time, it is important to say that there are a lot of parliaments, uh, a lot of aspects that they are, uh, that they, that they are having uh, a, a way of, inf of influence at the child's life. And it is not only the way that the, the, the child is, is raising, it is also the environment, the quality of the air, the quality of the food, the everyday life uh, and, the, and sports, and etc. So I, I would like to say that we have a very first duty and it is to explain to the people that it is not something that it happens once in a million. It is something that has happened at the next door. And we have to consider that we have to support all these people by giving them all the, the, the available facilities, all the available instruments that we have. Thank you, Maria. Um, Professor Kearns, you uh, have the floor, please. 
Thank you. I just um, to comment on this particular question. I absolutely agree that we need to increase public awareness. Um, the majority of the average population do not know that children get cancer. And it's a shock to every parent who gets that diagnosis that their child could ever suffer from such a disease. And it is even important in the medical profession. Um, the, the average general practitioner probably sees one child with cancer in their entire career and there's a huge risk that they may not recognize the symptoms because the symptoms are very soft and therefore the awareness that this is a possibility in order to get early diagnosis is really important. But it is also important to remember that the, by far the majority of childhood cancers are not preventable. It is unlike the situation in adult cancer where we are aware that environmental issues, uh, lifestyle issues, uh, obesity, alcohol, for example, smoking, lead to certain types of adult cancer. We do not have that modifiable, um, modifiable preventative action that we can do today in childhood cancer. There is a lot of research that needs to be done to understand the biology, the embryogenesis of childhood cancer. But I think it sometimes gets lost in discussions about um, programs of prevention. The, the issue of prevention gets raised for childhood cancer. But as of today, the question I can never answer to a parent is why did my child get cancer? And when a parent says to me, what can I have done to have stopped it? We don't know the answer to that question. Um, so, and we must make it absolutely clear for most parents who often feel the blame of the fact their child got cancer, that it is nothing they did, nothing that they did that made their child get cancer. So we need to be sure that the prevention story is more in the childhood cancer frame, is about more understanding why children get cancer, what is the biology that drives it, uh, in, you, probably something to do with the embryogenesis and the epigenetics of, of, of the disease rather than necessarily something in the environment. So I just want to make that point because it sometimes gets uh, uh, um, uh, blurred when we start talking about prevention. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Um, looking at the poll, it seems that two thirds of our participants favor the development of uh, spur drugs um, dedicated to childhood cancers and um, a smaller part uh, on survivorship programs and then even smaller on fundamental research. I would also say uh, that all three probably are important, um, but uh, it's good to see the priorities. I have in the chat also someone who mentioned, uh, we don't have time to elaborate too much on that, that of course there's children with cancer and adolescents outside of the EU. So whatever we do within the EU um, may also benefit uh, these children and adolescents, and I'm sure that we uh, agree on that. So, so thanks for raising that point. Um, I think it's time, I'm sorry for that, to finish this session already. Um, I don't have other uh, urgent questions in the chat or on Spido, uh, Slido. Sorry. Thanks for participating in the poll. And I will now uh, give the floor um, to uh, the chair, one of the co-chairs of uh, the MEPs Against Cancer, Véronique Trillet-Lenoir, for the final well, statement. Hello. Véronique, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Lucas and Christian, dear friends committed with me together to fight against cancer in general and pediatric cancers in particular. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for your strong and constant commitment towards improving the access to diagnosis, treatment and care for pediatric cancer patients. It is quite uh, difficult to take the floor again after you, Angelo, you have so brightly uh, said what we know, but is always difficult and and inspiring to, to hear. Thank you. Uh, since, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we, uh, we have uncertainties on the budget aspects, which we should really uh, think about very uh, strongly together now. I propose to brainstorm on the availability of future legislative means to move, to move forward on uh, children uh, cancers. Most of them have already been described. Uh, the main one is research. Uh, thank you, uh, my dear friend Christine, for having uh, 
said very strongly again that recommendation 11 of the cancer mission of Horizon Europe will be followed. I am convinced that the mission will also integrate new technologies among which uh, intelli uh, artificial intelligence causes treatments, but also the social aspects to this approach. And I will come back to it uh, later. I suggest that we should discuss on three main other tracks. The first one, you mentioned it uh, very often, is the opportunity on pediatric cancer drugs. Despite the EU pediatric medicines regulations 13 years ago, uh, less than 10% of children in advanced phase, phase have access to new drugs. And as you said, Angelo, only seven or maybe nine innovative targeted anti-cancer drugs were authorized for pediatric malignancies. We should take the opportunity of the EP resolution on December 2016 and the declaration of Stella Kyriakides to push for a revision of the regulation. The future Europe beating cancer plan and pharmaceutical strategy for Europe should help us help us to guarantee the access to innovative drugs, to determine the most important drugs to respond to the needs of the children, to reduce the delays for pediatric medicines to reach children, and to tackle the limited access to some essential medicines due to drug shortages or the high price of, innovation, of innovative medicines. Point number two, at the same time, we should also improve the current European legislation to guarantee an uh, equal access across Europe to standard care, expertise, and clinical research. And as already said by Christian, and we share this point, we should ensure the extension of European reference networks to reduce inequalities in access across Europe and even beyond. We should evaluate if needed to reinforce the children's right to cross-border care. I know that Lucas is uh, very keen on that, that one. We should fully implement the clinical trials regulation to facilitate academic research on childhood cancer and improve patients and parents' improvement. And we should think of better support to the patient's family. You mentioned that, Angelo, not only from the medical point of view, but also to offer the child and his family better social, educational, psychological, and financial support. And this is my point number three. We should ensure the quality of survivorship. Uh, we could promote guidelines to follow all possible late occurring side effects and concurrent treatments and set up a survivorship passport. I have in mind that Gilles Vassal uh, has uh, mentioned that before. Uh, we should include childhood cancer survivorship issues in EU programs and policies. And last but not least, what about facing what, uh, one of the main type of discrimination being considered in, uh, uninsurable by promoting the right to be forgotten. For instance, in France, Belgium, and Luxembourg, cancer survivors who had cancer under 18 should not be discriminated against other consumers. This right should be available in all the member states. So you see that we need money. We don't know how much the budget, what the budgets will be, but we have legislative regulations that we can use and activate uh, to uh, improve uh, cancer uh, care uh, for uh, children. And uh, as a MEPS Against Cancer co-chair with Lucas, a member of the Beating Cancer Committee, and of course, as a medical oncologist, I will do my best to push the issue of childhood cancer high up the European agenda. Thank you very much. Great. 
Thank you very much, Veronique, and thank you for everyone uh, who participated. And we will be in touch with the recording uh, of this webinar and the presentations and uh, also with a report uh, summarizing the discussions and, and key points mentioned today. And we'll try to make sure that MEPs Against yeah. Cancer and the Cancer Committee work together on this issue. Thank you so much again, everyone.